Brad, so it's my pleasure to introduce Matthew to speak to us today. Thanks, Joel. And I'm very lucky to be visiting SMRI for the last two weeks from University of Auckland. Today, I'll be talking about some joint work with my colleague, Jeroen. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a problem that Jeroen and I have been working on for the last year, and we just um, put a paper up on archive about a month ago to do with this. And it's to do with yeah, classifying two generated subgroups of PSL2 over the periodic numbers, or more generally, two generated subgroups of PSL2 over a non-Archimedean local field subject to some mild conditions, um, which are discrete. And so I'll start with a bit of motivation about why we got interested in this problem in the first place. Okay, so take two um, elements of PSL2 over the complex numbers. So that's the set of two by, well, SL2 series, set of two by two uh, complex entry complex entry matrices of determinant one, and then you um, quotient out by the center to get PSL2C. Um, given that any two generated subgroup of this group, is it discrete? And so by that, I mean, you take the topology associated to SL2C by embedding it into a four-dimensional complex vector space, and then you take the corresponding quotient topology when you pass to PSL2. So is this group discrete with respect to that topology? Is every, um, is every set, is every subset open? Um, and so discrete subgroups of PSL2C are called Kleinian groups. They've been studied a lot in the literature. Um, a lot of work has been done, and this is one, sorry, one particular example um, of a class of two generator subgroups of PSL2C, which has been um, extensively studied. So you look at the two generator subgroup of PSL2C generated by um, matrices, or generated by these elements, um, which I've put up there, the sort of representatives in SL2C of these elements of PSL2. Um, so you take these two matrices, there's some um, complex number rho, and clearly these generate a discrete group when rho is a Gaussian integer. Um, each matrix, when you sort of embed it into C4 and then take this quotient topology, each matrix is isolated. Uh, and moreover, uh, these groups are both discrete and free, meaning that there's um, no non-trivial words which represent the identity in your group. Um, for all rho which lie in this geometric structure called the Riley slice. So you take complex plane and for every rho which is in this sort of colored bit here called the Riley slice, um, your group G rho is known to be discrete and free. Uh, so quite a lot of work has gone into this and this is sort of yeah, motivating where we're coming from. We're interested in two generated uh, linear groups over some field the question of how can we tell whether such a group is discrete or not. In general, this question is still open. There's no sort of universal method to determine whether a given two generated subgroup of PSL2C is discrete or not. Yeah, Murray? Slides sort of independently defined by our property. So the Riley slice is defined basically sort of or the original, yeah, the Riley slice is defined just based on this group. Um, but then there's Jeroen and uh, Gavin Martin, who's based at Massey um, in Auckland as well. Uh, they've been working on sort of generalizations of this to any two generator subgroup. You can have some, some parameters and then get some similar version, some analog of the Riley slice in that particular setting. But the original Riley slice was just for groups of this form, this sort of two generator subgroups with one parameter. Uh, so yeah, what there's a lot going on in this picture. This picture is actually of these things called pleating rays, um, which is what Jeroen and Gavin and one of their master students have been working on. And there's kind of these these lines in complex space parameterized by polynomials and sort of as you as you come in, you're defining, you've got a sort of a sequence of all these um, complex numbers row, which all define discrete and free subgroups of PSL2C. And then you sort of terminate on something that has a particular structure. And then this inside bit, you kind of have some discrete groups scattered around. And then, um, yeah, there's 
there's a lot, a lot of stuff going on, on in there. Basically. Um, but the, the, the point I want to get across is that um, for every row, which are kind of outside on the exterior of this kind of white bit here, we know that those groups are discrete and free. Yeah. It could possibly be. Oh, okay. So the, the two bullet points are discrete because they're not discrete. Yeah. 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 No. So, yeah, it's two separate things. The second bullet point refers to this picture. Um, this first thing is just some other. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you take a Gaussian integer, so I think this is, I think this is the point uh, four, and this is minus four, and then there'll be some sort of dark points inside this white bit, which are discrete because they're Gaussian integers. Um, and then we know that everything else outside is also discrete and free. And so one thing I should mention, which is kind of the, the theme of this talk, is that uh, at least the, the Riley slice stuff, it comes from studying the action of PSL2C on the Riemann sphere um, or on hyperbolic free space. Um, so the, the point is we can investigate the structure of groups by how they act on geometric um, structures. So as I said, over the complex numbers, it's impossible to completely classify all discrete two generated subgroups. But if we restrict to the real numbers, uh, there is a complete classification. Um, so this was done by the work of uh, sort of many people in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they, they figured out that if you take any discrete two generator subgroup of PSL2 over the real numbers, there's a sort of finite list of isomorphism types of your group. So uh, you can be cyclic or infinite dihedral. You could be discrete and free of rank two. It could be various free products of finite cyclic groups and the integers. Uh, this is an example of something called a hyperbolic triangle group. And then these other um, groups with these strange presentations here. Um, and the point is, this is what this is what Yerun and I have sort of developed an anal analogous result of that you take a two generated subgroup of PSL2 over some field and we can list the isomorphism types. And so in this case, uh, a lot of this was determined by the act, studying the action of these, el these um, elements of PSL2R by Mobius transformations on the upper half plane. Um, and moreover, uh, this class, so there is this classification that if your group is discrete, then it has to be in one of these isomorphism classes. But also if you um, sort of the work gives you an algorithm as well, that if you give you give these people or you give some computer system a two generator subgroup of PSL2R, which is sufficiently nice, meaning you can um, distinguish by inequality sort of entries between matrices. So let's say a, a two generated subgroup of PSL2 over the rationals. Um, then there's a myth, then there's sort of a practical algorithm, there's a sequence of trace calculations and Nielsen transformations you can do um, to check which of these sort of isomorphism types you lie in and therefore whether or not your group is discrete. Okay, so our motivating question is, is this hard problem of identifying two generator discrete subgroups of a PSL2C, uh, uh, easier problem of um, identifying discrete two generator subgroups of PSL2 over the reals, what about other, uh, over other locally compact fields? Can we classify discrete two generator subgroups of PSL2 um, over such fields? So the real numbers and the complex numbers lie in a, a large class of fields called local fields, um, which are fields that are locally compact with respect to the topology induced by some non-trivial absolute value. Um, these fields are split into two subclasses. Uh, there's Archimedean ones, which are all uh, isomorphic as topological fields to either the real numbers or complex numbers. And we've already discussed sort of what's known and not known about those. And then all the other ones are called non-Archimedean and they satisfy um, a sort of stronger version of the triangle inequality called the ultrametric inequality. Um, and so an equivalent definition of a non-Archimedean local field um, if you have seen these before, you might have seen uh, this definition or this one um, is that 
a non-Archimedean local field K is complete with respect to its absolute value. And it has this mapping called a discrete valuation, uh, basically taking every element of K and assigning it an integer value and it assigns zero the value of infinity. Um, and so I don't want to go, I don't want to get sucked into the details and bogged down with all, what all this stuff actually means, but for what we need to know for this talk, um, we have a non-Archimedean local field and there's some associated valuation which gives an integer output for each non-zero element and the output infinity for zero. Um, and so a, a classic example of a non-Archimedean local field is the p-adic numbers. Uh, how they're defined, you take any rational number x um, and some prime p, and you sort of factor out from the numerator and denominator of x um, all the powers of p, and the um, once you've done that factoring out, this power R of P is called the valuation or the periodic valuation of your rational number X. Um, and that defines this, this discrete valuation, which is this thing here. Um, and then we can define a corresponding non-Archimedean absolute value and complete the rationals with respect to that. And that gives you the periodic numbers. So throughout the rest of the talk, K is gonna be one of these non-Archimedean local fields with valuation V and this thing called a residue field, which is finite. So you take all the elements with non-negative valuation and quotient out by the ones with positive valuation. Um, that is finite for every non-Archimedean local field. That's gonna have, um, the size of that finite field will be P to the R for some prime P. Um, and if that's confusing, just think of K as being the periodic numbers. So we're gonna sort of fix this for the rest of the talk, essentially. Uh, any questions at this point? Okay. So here's the sort of statement of our, our main result that we've proved. Um, as I said, it's analogous to the classification for two generated discrete subgroups of PSL2R. Um, so we're gonna either take a discrete two generator subgroup of PSL2 over the p-adic numbers, QP, or one over any non-Archimedean local field if we impose the condition that this group doesn't contain any elements of order P, where P is the prime that define, defines the um, order of a finite residue field for this particular, um, particular non-Archimedean local field. And so I'll, I'll explain a bit later why we need this condition. And one, one open question we have right now is, can we remove this condition and still have some sort of classification? Um, a lot of our proofs kind of don't follow through as nicely. Um, so we, we need to do a bit more further work to remove this condition. But anyway, if we, if we don't have any elements of order P in this group G, then we've got a nice classification analogous to um, the case of PSL2R. So we either have uh, finite subgroups, which are either cyclic dihedral, the alternating group of degree four or five, or the symmetric group of degree four. Um, your group could be free of rank two, or again, these three products of finite cyclic groups and the integers. You could have a direct product of a finite cyclic group and the integers. Uh, you could be the integers themselves, or you get, these are the two interesting cases, and they were the hardest to sort of figure out. Um, you either get an H and N extension of a dihedral group of odd type or of A4, or one of the following five amalgamated free, free products. So it's quite, these are very similar to the case of PSL2R, and this is different and pretty interesting. And it's, yeah, we get a very limited list. So each of these discrete two generator subgroups has to lie in one of these classes. So in addition to that, we also get an algorithm. So if you give me a two generator subgroup of PSL2 over some non-Archimedean local field, and you either tell me that that field is the p or you promise me that there's no elements of order P in it, um, then we can uh, perform a, a finite sequence of checks essentially to see uh, if our group is discrete and if it is, which of these isomorphism types it belongs to. Um, and again, that kind of comes with the, I say the word algorithm, uh, but I mean sort of, yeah, again, up to finite precision. It's a similar thing to with the real numbers. 
um, there's yeah there's only so much you can expect our computer programs to do um, and so it can yeah yeah but you have these sort of periodic numbers that are given to infinite precision in general but a computer can only store a finite portion of that um, so that can cause some issues but if you've got nice nice matrices then we can yeah we can figure out what the whether your group is discrete or not okay so I'll talk a little bit about how we've proved this. Uh, but first, some background. So as I said, the analogous case of PSL2, C, and R, um, those classifications or determining whether such a group is discrete, you study the action on the um, upper half plane or the hyperbolic plane or the Riemann sphere or one of these geometric structures. And so that's what we want to do in our non-Archimedean setting as well. So we have our group PSL2K it acts by isometries on a Q plus one regular Bruja Tietz tree. Um, well, Q plus one regular simplicial tree, which is called the Bruja Tietz tree. Um, where again, here Q is the size of your finite residue field associated to the um, your non Archimedean local field K. And this is a picture of the, the Bruja Tietz tree corresponding to. Uh, let's say Q2, the two attic numbers. It's a two plus one, so three regular tree, which you can see every vertex has three neighbors and then it goes off to infinity. And trees are particularly nice because isometries of a tree can be classified and they're very well understood. Um, each isometry of a tree has a given translation link, which is the smallest possible distance that moves any vertex of that tree. And uh, such isometries can be classified based on their translation length. So you either have elliptic isometries which fix a point, um, and throughout the talk we're going to use fix G to denote the fixed point set of this elliptic element. Uh, or hyperbolic isometries, which essentially they have this uh, by infinite path in the tree called the translation axis and they translate along that um, and then sort of the action for any other point it sort of projects onto the axis moves along and then projects off again so the the action of isometries on the tree is very well understood and you can classify them based on translation length moreover by a result of Morgan and Shalin Uh, in 1984, uh, given any element of PSL2K, you can compute its translation length on the Bruja Tietz tree uh, just by computing the valuation of the trace of either of the representative matrices in SL2K. Um, and you take minus two times the minimum of zero and that valuation. So very algebraic. Um, give me a matrix and I just plug it into this formula and I can tell you exactly how it acts on the Bruhard Tietz tree. Uh, moreover, so this is sort of the first thing that we found we needed and this is the, the sticking point for the order P elements. This is why we need to exclude them. Um, if you take any finite order um, element of PSL2K, finite order element has to be elliptic and turns out it's if n is the order of this element and p doesn't divide n or we're working in the periodic numbers, then this fixed point set of this element a is either a single vertex of the tree, a single edge, or a bi-infinite path. It's very restrictive. But as soon as we allow for order p elements or elements of order divisible by p, you can get these sort of balls in the tree of arbitrarily large radius. Um, which kind of yeah mucks up our classification. So we're, we're ignoring them for now. And we're lucky that, yeah, when you're in the periodic numbers, uh, if P is strictly larger than three, there aren't any order of P elements anyway. Um, and if P is two or three, um, those are easy to, easy to classify. So we can still do this for the periodic numbers. Okay, so uh, key theorem which underlies our classification is that take any two generator group acting by isometries of a tree, then we can perform some finite translation length minimizing procedure. So by that, I mean, you take two generators, 
suppose both of them are hyperbolic. Um, this translation, translation length minimizing procedure tries to sort of replace these generators by equivalent generators with smaller translation length. Um, and what this does is you end up in sort of a, a finite number of possibilities. And so maybe after doing all this translation length reduction, you end up with two elliptic generators, A and B of your group. And if they have a common fixed point, then your whole group will fix a vertex of the tree. So this is case one. You perform this translation length minimizing procedure and you get two generators which both fix a common vertex. So your whole group fixes the vertex of the tree. Uh, maybe you perform this translation length minimizing procedure and again, you get two elliptic elements, uh, but with disjoint fixed point sets. So that's this first thing I've done in the sort of semi-transparent font. Uh, then you get your group as a free product of A and B. Um, there's a few other cases. So you could have an elliptic and a hyperbolic as your generators with small overlap between the fixed point set and the axis or two hyperbolics with, again, a, a small overlap. Um, and how this minimizing procedure works is that if you have two hyperbolic elements with a large overlap, it can reduce this overlap until you lie and um, until you either get an elliptic generator or two elliptic generators, and then you'd be in either of these cases, maybe an elliptic and a hyperbolic or two hyperbolics with a, a short overlap. Uh, so then there's two remaining cases. Maybe you have an elliptic generator and a hyperbolic with, a, with an infinite um, overlap between the fixed point set and the axis um, or a sort of large finite overlap. And so this first case, um, the intersection between the fixed point set of A and the axis of your hyperbolic generator B um, is infinite. And then we can conclude that either A commutes to the power of B or there's an infinite vertex stabilizer in your group. So an infinite number of elements of G which fix some vertex of the tree. And then this is the horrible case. Uh, and this is... This is what corresponds to the H and N extensions and amalgamated free products and took us the longest to sort of deal with. These are all relatively nice. This is not so nice. Um, it's the case where you've got an elliptic and hyperbolic generator where the um, fixed point set intersects the axis in a large finite path. Um, and so here, yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but we say that Y is the terminal vertex of this path, meaning that that's the path of this, um, the vertex of this path, which your hyperbolic element B translates towards. Remember the axis is B acts on its axis by translations. We define this strange subgroup G by taking conjugates of A by um, higher and higher powers of B up until um, this point K, which is, yeah, the floor of the length of your path divided by the translation length. Um, and then we have three options. Either you get an H and N extension straight away. Um, and this follows from uh, applying a, a klein maskett combination theorem. So it's kind of similar to um, yeah, Klein's combination theorem or ping pong lemma type thing, um, which give combinatorial conditions for a group to generate a free group. But in this case, you get combinatorial conditions for a group to um, be an H and N extension. And if these conditions fail, then you're in one of these two cases. Um, and so I'll elaborate on these two a bit, um, a bit later, because it turns out we can simplify these. But yeah, so these are some not so nice cases, but yeah, essentially this is the nasty case. And either you're an H and N extension, or some nasty things happen and we're going to simplify those nasty things and uh, figure out what to do, essentially. Yeah, Mari. Uh, so here it's like, yeah, so it's not, not a subgroup of G naught, but B is acting like your stable letter, basically, in the, in the H and N extension. Okay, so now, so that was quite general. That was for any group, any two generated subgroup of isometries of a tree. Um, if we now restrict back to our setting that we're interested in um, subgroups of PSL2K, uh, a result of Cato in 2005 says that uh, 
you take any subgroup of PSL two K. If it's discrete, then every vertex stabilizer is finite. And on the other hand, if you have some vertex, some finite vertex stabilizer, then your group is discrete. So this is sort of one of the key things we're going to use to determine discreteness of our two generator subgroup G of PSL two K. Um, so yeah, back to our sort of original conditions, we fix some two generator subgroup G of PSL two K. And we assume that K is either the periodic numbers or it contains no elements of order P. Uh, we apply our key theorem. So remember there were these four cases. First case was that the group fixes a vertex. And because the group fixes a vertex by Cato's result, the whole group has to be finite. Um, so this, uh, yeah, key theorem one, this case says that our group is discrete if and only if it's finite. Um, and it's well known that um, finite linear groups containing no elements of order P or finite special linear groups containing no elements of order P um, are either cyclic dihedral or um, alternating or symmetric groups of degree four or five as listed there. Uh, the second case was that G was a free product of A and B. And by Cato's result, uh, we're not allowed to have any infinite order elliptics because that an infinite order elliptic, remember an elliptic fixes a vertex and if it's got infinite order, every power of that element will also fix that vertex. So you've got an infinite vertex stabilizer, therefore your group is not discrete. So in this case, in case two, you get a free product um, between two elements, neither of which can be elliptic of infinite order. So they either have to be both hyperbolic and then you get a free group, or maybe one of them is elliptic of finite order, and then you get this free product, or maybe both of them are elliptic of finite order, and then you get a free product of two finite cyclic groups. Uh, then the third case, that was where you, we had an elliptic generator and a hyperbolic one that intersect in an infinite path. Um, and the two conclusions were either your elliptic one commutes with the power of the hyperbolic, or your group contains an infinite vertex stabilizer. But we know that if G is to be discrete, it can't contain an infinite vertex stabilizer. So A has to commute with the power of B. And because we're essentially working with matrices, if one matrix commutes with the power of another, then they, the matrices themselves commute. And so you get a, a direct product. Uh, so this is where this comes from. Again, your elliptic element A has to be finite order. Um, otherwise, you're not discrete. Okay, so those are the three easy cases, and we sort of knock those out pretty quickly. It's the fourth one that was troublesome, um, and so I'll try to I'll try my best to outline that without going into too much of the details. Um, so here at the top, I've just I've made this semi-transparent again. This is just to remind you all the horrible conditions that were going on in case four. You had this elliptic element A intersecting with fixed point set intersecting the axis of the hyperbolic element B in a large finite path, um, and all these all these possibilities. Uh, and we have this group G naught, which is defined by certain conjugates of A. And so, if I I can probably draw a picture of this. the axis of our hyperbolic element B and the fixed point set of our elliptic element A. And remember that the fixed point set of any finite order elliptic, so if our group is discrete, we have to, the, any elliptic has to be finite order. We know that this fixed point set is either a single vertex, a single edge, or a bi-infinite path in the tree. And so if this overlap is of length, at least the translation length of some hyperbolic, um, turns out this fixed point set has to also, that you've got two bi-infinite paths that intersect. Um, and then this is our, our vertex Y, and B is translating towards Y. And so we define this group G naught in such a way that every element of G naught um, fixes Y. So A fixes Y because it's on the fixed point set of A. Um, B, A, B inverse, uh, you take the fixed point set of A and then you translate it along B. And so 
you're going to get something like that. And so you can see that y still belongs to um, that fixed point set. So this is the fixed point set of the AB inverse. OK. So yeah, the point is this group G0 fixes y. And so um, basically, G0 has to be finite. The vertex stabilizer of y um, contains G0. And therefore, G0 has to be finite if G is to be discrete. So this is sort of our first um, reduction. And this is where the sort of yeah, tricky part lies. We needed two key results um, to be able to simplify and break down this, this horrible case. Um, so the first one was observing that if you have a finite subgroup which fixes at least two vertices of your tree, um, and again, under this condition that you assume this group doesn't contain any elements of order P, um, or you're working over the periodic numbers, then that group is actually abelian. And so the way we proved this was, well, if it's a finite subgroup of PSL2K under these two conditions, we know it's either cyclic dihedral A4, S4, or A5. And then you can look at generating pairs of those groups, um, and you can you use those relations to compare the, the fixed point sets. And since we know a fixed point set is either a, a vertex and edge or a by infinite path, you end up getting contradictions in all the cases apart from the Klein 4 group and the cyclic group. Um, so if you fix at least two vertices of your tree, your group has to be abelian. Um, so that implies case two doesn't actually occur because if G0 contains some subgroup fixing at least two vertices. Uh, then this subgroup H, which properly contains this thing, um, is abelian. And that tells you there's two conjugates of A by powers of B which commute. And that ends up giving a contradiction to what the um, basically, yeah, two things commute if their um, axes are exactly the same. And so you can see the, the fixed point set of BAB inverse looks like this, and the fixed point set of A looks like that. They have um, distinct axes, so they can't commute. Um, so that means we can rule out case two. And moreover, we can also deduce that this finite path has to have length exactly equal to the translation length of B, because as soon as you make it any larger, um, a and B, B, A, B inverse um, fix at least two vertices of your tree. And again, similar argument shows those two things can't commute. Uh, so that was one of the key results we needed. The other one was that um, fixed point sets are preserved under non-trivial powers. So again, looking at finite order elements within these groups where these groups contain no elements of order P, um, you look at a fixed point set of some finite order element A, it's the same as the fixed point set of all its non-trivial powers. This is quite strong. And again, this result falls apart if we allow elements of order P, because um, as I said, fixed point sets of elements of order P can be balls of a large radius. And it turns out as you take higher powers, the radius increases. So we lose this property, and this is sort of fundamental to our, our classification. All right, so using that first key result, we've now simplified to the case that we've got an elliptic and hyperbolic generator. They intersect in a path of length exactly equal to the translation length of your hyperbolic. Um, we know that this group G0 is now just defined by, it's the group generated by A and B, A, B inverse. And the old case two can't happen. So either you're an H and N extension, um, or there exists some element in your group G0 which takes uh, BY. So here's my vertex BY um, to B inverse Y. And we know that that's over here because this intersection is the length of the, is the translation length of B. And so our element G. It fixes y because it lies in G0 and it maps by to b inverse y. 
And so this, this is all the information we actually have um, from our sort of our key theorem case four, but because we have this fixed point power property, you can actually deduce by um, doing some, some quite clever arguments that any G which does this, um, you look at the fixed point set of GB and compare it to the fixed point set of GB squared and do some similar arguments and you end up showing that this element G is actually a reflection in the axis of B. So you take any point along the axis of B and G will reflect it about this point Y um, to the other side. And then that's enough for us to use um, one of the Klein, the other klein maskett combination theorem, which gives G the structure of an amalgamated free product. So now you get G, this group G naught and the group generated by A and GB, which this element GB turns out to have order two because of our fixed point power um, property, amalgamated over the cyclic subgroup generated by A. Um, this subgroup turns out to be dihedral, and so we get an amalgamated free product looking like that. So the, all the sort of nasty cases of case four end up basically just saying that G is discrete if and only if it's one of these, if and only if it's an H and N extension or an amalgamated free product, and we know what the generators of these things are. Um, and so a couple more remarks uh, using our, our two sort of key results. Again, um, fixed point sets are preserved under non-trivial powers of a finite order elliptic and um, any group fixing at least two vertices is abelian. Or any finite group fixing at least two vertices is abelian. We can show that um, G naught can't be cyclic or dihedral of even type. Um, and this reflection G naught always exists if G naught is isomorphic to S4 or A5. So you can't get the H and N extension case in either of these when G naught is one of these groups. Um, so you're either an H and N extension of an odd type dihedral group or A4, or you get these five possible amalgamated free products by looking at um, all the possible orders of A for which this group G naught can generate either um, a dihedral group A4, S4, or A5. So it's quite, it's a very, very limited list. Okay, uh, any questions at this point? Could I just ask some comments? So, so I just think so that often these um, funny subgroups have some kind of number theory. Um, origin, so imagine we've got a field or something to do um, subgroups that I was just trying to imagine where these subgroups might arise in number theory. Or, you know, is there, some, is there something number theory that can be said that, about the story of it? That's not, yeah, not something we've looked into exactly, but I imagine so. Well, certainly in the Piatic case, there's lots of connections to number theory. So maybe a number theoretic approach might give some intuition for this. Um, there's, so in terms of a geometry perspective, um, there's sort of a, it's known that if, if your group satisfies some certain properties, then it can always be written as an amalgamated free product in some way. Um, and so well, from a geometric perspective, some people like might not really care which amalgamated free products we get. Um, but yeah, we're, we're actually able to sort of classify them. But yeah, from a num number theory perspective, I haven't, haven't really thought about that. Um, no, interesting question. Is there any explanation for the, for the first one you gave in terms of what the the sort of all the free products and um, oh those ones that you ruin might be able to answer that more than me that's um i've sort of yeah most of my research has just been on the sort of piatic case with the using the complex one as sort of motivation um there's yeah there, there probably are connections but that's yeah not my not my area of expertise the other thing that i was wondering about is if i take um qp and then I take extensions of it. Yeah. Do you see that some some extensions are kind of more handleable than others? 
yeah well so in terms of what we want to do um i think yeah if you if you take finite extensions of qp then you allow for some order p elements um so i think if i think if you take certain extensions they won't contain any order p elements yeah yeah i think there's definitely so this is there's a paper of Lombotsky that covers the sort of two cases, ramified, unramified, and then he actually gives formula for how to compute the radius of these fixed points, of these fixed point balls of these order P elements in those groups. Um, and there's, yeah, there's, there's two different cases, but yeah, I suspect maybe the order P elements only occur in one of them. I'm just not exactly sure which one. And the final question I was wondering about, do you know, um, like for these beasts you're trying to um do they they definitely exist in yeah yeah that's my next slide <laughs> yeah so yeah we, we have this classification we've checked that these these things actually exist and that it's a i didn't think one of the journey that the ones that we're avoiding is oh yeah 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 no you you can definitely get these sort of i don't know if you take some horrible finite extent you can get order p elements in there with these nasty fixed point sets that increase as you take powers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, yeah, this doesn't quite answer the question, but yeah, the um, all the groups we've given in our classification, we've actually gone through and checked can we find examples which generate um, these types just to make sure we, we didn't miss anything or we weren't listing things that you can't actually um, make. So, I think at first we had listed saying G could be an HM extension of a yeah, cyclic dihedral A4, S4, A5. And we, it was quite interesting to find out that it turns out the only ones for which that can actually occur are the dihedral of odd type A4, I think it was. Um, so yeah, here's some, some actual linear algebra. Uh, if pi is a uniformizer of your non-Archimedean local field, so for the p-adic numbers, you could just take pi to equal the prime p. Um, you can look at matrix well an element of a of psl2 represented by this matrix and b represented by this matrix where t is chosen specifically so that a has some fixed finite order n so that the order depends on the trace um, and then you can show using a bit of algebra and geometry that uh, the fixed point set of this element is disjoint from the axis of this hyperbolic element and therefore they generate a um, discrete free product of the cyclic group of order n and the integers. Uh, more generally, and brushing a lot of things under the rug here, this was quite a lot of work to show, but all the H and N extensions and amalgamated free products that we list can all be generated by a matrix um, or an element A represented by this matrix and an element B represented by this matrix, where again, T is chosen um, so that A has a fixed order, fixed finite order N, and then you do some arguments using Hensel's lemma to find out what A is um, to make sure that our group G naught is one of these things we wanted it to be, a dihedral A4, S4, A5, um, and we get all the relationships we want. Yeah, so Hensel's lemma essentially says that, um, for well, restricting to the case of QP to make things a bit easier, um, that if you are interested in a, a solution, we're tr trying to find a solution to some equation in the p-adic numbers. If you can find solutions in mod p, so over the finite field of p elements, then you can lift those to solutions mod p squared and then higher and higher powers. And then eventually, um, if everything works out, you get solutions in qp. Yeah, so it's sort of a way of projecting down to a simple case. And if there's a solution there, you can pull it back up to the um, the addicts or the non Archimedean local field that you start with. Okay, so now a bit of a side note. Um, and so we have uh, Pierre Emmanuel Capras to thank for this. Um, our algorithm to determine whether a two generated subgroup of PSL2K or PSL2QP is discrete actually also gives a method to decide density of a two generated subgroup of. SL2 over the p-adics. Um, and so very briefly, that essentially works as follows, that if you take a, any, a subgroup of SL2 over the p-adics, 
if it's not discrete, then being dense is equivalent to being Zariski dense, dense in the Zariski topology. Um, and if you're not Zariski dense, then you either stabilize a vertex, an end, or a pair of ends of your tree. So essentially what, what you do is you give me a two-generated subgroup of SL2QP. I look at the corresponding subgroup of PSL2QP, plug it into our discreteness algorithm. Um, if that says, yes, your group is discrete, you know it's not dense. Um, so suppose it's not discrete, then we know it's dense if and only if it's the risky dense. And so we just need to check it doesn't stabilize a vertex, doesn't stabilize an end or a pair of ends of your tree. Um, and I won't go into the details uh, in the context of time, uh, but these geometric conditions can be checked algebraically. So we can actually do this and I've coded up um, in Magma how to actually do this algorithm. Um, so for instance, if you have a two generated group with one of the generators hyperbolic, then your group stabilizes an end of your tree if and only if the trace of the commutator is two. And this, this is because SL2 over the p addicts acts on the boundary of your tree by Mobius transformations similar to the action of SL2R on um, the hyperbolic plane by Mobius transformations. So yeah, there's, you can check similar sort of trace computations or translation length comparisons will tell you whether any of these things happen. Um, so this gives an algorithm deciding density of a two-generated subgroup of SL2 over the p addicts. Uh, so then I'll end with a couple of open questions, um, some of which are probably quite ambitious and we may not be able to solve. Um, one I've already mentioned, if we do have these elements of order P, is there anything we can do? We lose this fixed point power property that fixed point sets of finite order elliptics are preserved under taking powers. Can we somehow bypass that and have arguments in other ways? Um, not sure. Uh, this one is maybe possible to do. Um, the, on, I think on my second slide, I gave the classification of all two generator discrete um, subgroups of PSL2R. Um, using that, uh, the constructive membership problem has been solved for two generator discrete subgroups of PSL2R. And so by that I mean, um, take any, two any given two generated subgroup G of um, PSL2R, which you know is discrete, uh, and then take some finitely generated subgroup H of this group. Uh, and then some other random element G in the group, the constructive membership problem asks, does this element G lie in the subgroup H? Um, and if it does, can you write it as a, um, a word in the generators? And so the, the classification, sort of geometry underlying the classification leads to a solution to this constructive membership problem. Can we do the analogous thing here? Um, yeah, that's something we're, we're currently thinking about. It, yeah, we're hoping it should be straightforward enough, but yeah, who knows? Um, and then finally, can we maybe classify three generator discrete subgroups of PSL2K or higher, um, give on a higher number of generators? Um, again, this is probably the most ambitious question, but there's potentially some hope in that uh, these two guys have given a list of all possible amalgamated free products that you could get in theory um, for any finitely generated subgroup of PSL2 over a non-Archimedean local field. So maybe there's some hope that we can classify which one of those can arise as discrete three generator subgroups or four or so on. But yeah, again, out of these problems, I think the second one is probably the most feasible, but even then, not sure. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, please come and chat to us. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Yeah, you can say something about the model condition. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's one of the things I've brushed under the rug is that, so one of them is that you can determine whether the fixed point set of a non-trivial non -trivial finite order element is in any of these cases by looking at the order N modulo P. So there's sort of, there's modular conditions coming from here. And moreover, there's modular conditions under which your certain finite subgroups can appear. So I think for instance, A5 can only appear as a subgroup of PSL2K 
QP if P is congruent to plus or minus one mod five or something like that. Or maybe, no, plus or minus one mod 10. So there's two kind of modular, modular conditions. So yeah, yeah, you want the golden ratio to exist. So you want square root five to exist in the p-adics, um, which I think by Hensel's lemma ends up being equivalent to p being plus or minus one mod five um, or equivalently plus or minus one mod 10, I think. Yeah, those two modular conditions mean that in our actual classification here, uh, these Ns and Ms and even these ones, they only appear for sort of um, certain congruence classes of P or of N or M mod P. Is that a question? Uh, do, you, do you expect a similar theorem of A's multiple positive factors? Yes. In fact, what is it? There's a result that when it's, so this, this does cover local positive characteristic, so long as there's no elements of order P. Um, and I think, uh, what is it? It also applies to, I think there's some result about certain, when K is a certain positive characteristic local field, you can impose some other condition on G, which guarantees that it's got no, um, no order yeah, P elements. It's, it's a yeah, co-compact. And all the, all the P elements in those two very important. Open back, you can't have any. So there are the only is in the Yeah, but yeah, this K does allow for characteristic zero and characteristic or positive characteristic. Yeah. I have a question regarding this from the standard. Do you think that this P hasn't played a role in this case? Yeah. Also, that that's what I was saying in answer to your own question that these Ns and Ms. Uh, depend on p they like for instance i think maybe this one only exists if n is congruent to one mod p yeah jordy um, it seems like we're kind of pretty close to the other classified close subgroups yeah yeah because well, i think that probably ties into the the density thing as well it kind of yeah like have... the case and then yeah yeah <laughs> And yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Yeah, that's something we could definitely think about. Yeah, no, some, not something we've thought about, but yeah, I think I suspect there would be applications for that as well. There are no more questions in the online, and let's say that you're in the Thanks.